you get to look at my shipping center behind me. But this is it. I think it's rather stylish. Hi, I'm George the Antique Nomad. Come with me as I wander the country in search of valuable vintage, amazing antiques, and cool collectibles. We'll buy, sell, and trade at antique malls, shops, and shows, estate sales, flea markets, thrift stores, anywhere people go to find really interesting things that just aren't made anymore. So come on, let's go. Hello everybody and welcome. I'm George the Antique Nomad and this is my monthly bonus video. I am very excited to bring it to you. This is where I list items on eBay while you watch and the links are in the description and you can go right to them, follow the item. If you're a reseller and you're curious how these things do in the marketplace, you'll be able to follow it that way. Or if you're interested in the item, you can go right to it and you can make a bid or even buy it now. Provided that you're a level two member, you'll get to see these things first. I do release this video later to everybody, but the level two members help sponsor this. And since they're sponsoring the extra content, my gift to them is to give them first dibs. So if you are interested in memberships, you can click that join button at the top of the channel page and find out more about those or hit the link in the description. In the meantime, I put aside 20 items each month to put on eBay. I list them as we talk about them in this video, and I try to pick some premium things, some interesting things, a variety of things so that we can do some show and tell, learn a little more about what makes them interesting and fun for collectors, understand why they were made and how they were made and the people and places behind them. It just brings a dimension to the pieces and the collecting of them that I find interesting and I'm glad that a lot of you folks seem to as well. So without further ado, let's get started because I put some interesting things aside this month. The first item I have is this polar bear. Now, polar bears, of course, are in a lot of trouble these days and so there's even more interest in supporting them. There's a lot of uh, plush animals, for example, that you can buy that the proceeds go to help endangered species and that sort of thing. Uh, but it was always popular to have polar bears because there's something different that most of us never see in person. This one was not made by Yadro. Yadro made a lot of these in porcelain and it certainly has that look from a distance. But when you get up close and you see the mark, the mark is actually... Bing and Grondel. And that makes sense because, of course, the Danes had control of Greenland. They just do such a great job of modeling. The, the design is very true. It's very realistic. The colors are good. Their quality is always great. Bing and Grondel is no longer in production. Unfortunately, we've lost so many of our remaining producers that we all knew and loved over the past 10 or 15 years. So now people who are collecting these, well, they have to go to the secondary market. And I don't know exactly what the secondary market is on this piece. I haven't had a B&G before. I've only had the Yadros. And a Yadro this size typically sells in the $85 to $100 range. So I'll be curious to see how this goes. And it will be listing right now. Now this next little piece, lots of us see little crackle glass pitchers like this. These were made along the Ohio River and they were made by various companies. Blanco made a few, Kanawa made some, Pilgrim Glass made a lot, and that's who made this particular one. But this one has a special aspect to it that may not be clear to most of us because most of us are right-handed. This pitcher is a left-handed pitcher. If you look at the way the spout is turned, and you see it in my left hand, it's perfect for pouring from the left. If you're holding it in your right hand, the spout is in the wrong direction. Pilgrim Glass was one of the very few companies that ever took left-handed people into account when they were making these things. And I think that was very progressive of them, but I'm not really surprised. I had a personal involvement with Pilgrim Glass. When I was running the factory outlet center in Centralia, Washington, we, our antique malls got involved with the person who carved the cameo glass, Kelsey Murphy, and she worked at Pilgrim for quite a while. 
and made beautiful pieces there. And we went back to meet her. We saw the factory. We ended up opening a factory outlet for them to sell their seconds and overruns in our factory outlet center. And we also got to see their museum. And in the museum, they had these little left-handed pictures. Well, my mother is left-handed, so I went looking for one for her, finally found one. And they sell for somewhere in the $15 to $20 range. But they are just such a neat thing. It's a great design. Uh, Pilgrim Glass originally did a waffle mark on the pontils, but by the 1960s and 70s when they were doing these, it's more of a big open pontil, not quite as much of a scar as Blanco. So that may help you with identification. Crackle glass is also interesting to me because the way they get the crackling is that they take the piece while it's still in its molten stage when they're just forming it at about 1500 degrees Fahrenheit and they dunk it in cold water really fast and pull it out, which causes it to crack, but the heat is so great that it fuses it all right back together again so it doesn't fall apart. And that's how the crackling is done. So it's just a fun piece for a whole lot of reasons, and if any of you are lefties out there, well, maybe it will be something nice for your morning coffee. My next piece is also a glass pitcher, but this one is slightly larger. Well, okay, it's a whole lot larger. And it's a really nice one, but I think that I need to show it with maybe a piece of white paper behind it so that you can see the design a little bit more because it's got a wonderful golden urn in the middle. It's very flashy and tastefully decorated, and if you look there, you see a signature that says Georges Briard. Now, Georges Briard sounds very, very French. He was actually very, very Slavic. He emigrated to the United States and became an artist in New York, and after the Second World War, he was selling some of his original art, and he was doing painting on trays as well to make extra money, and he did not want the signature on the trays to match the signature on the art because he didn't want to downgrade the art in the art market. So a friend of his suggested that he take on a nom de plume and Georges Briard it was. Uh, these martini glasses and pitchers and things that he made, everything he made really was stylish, had a Holly Re Hollywood Regency feel, but it was all made to be accessible to people of middle to upper middle income. And so you would see these things in nice houses across the United States. He ended up making all sorts of things, everything from enameled ware to little tables ended up with his name and his designs on them. So the glass piece was not made by him, it was the design that came from him. And then he would factor out to various American factories to make the pieces themselves. Uh, this one, one thing to be very careful of with these is to make sure that the handle is well attached because these, if they were not well attached, could easily break. Also, if you're picking one up, you want to make sure that that hasn't been broken because otherwise the handle could just snap off in your hand and then you have martini surprise all over everybody and that's not a great thing. So, this is a pretty piece. I don't know exactly how well this pattern does. These martini pitchers, depending on the pattern, can sell anywhere from about $35 or $40 on up to $150. So we're going to put this one out there and see what it does. And again, whether you're seeing this video when it comes out or when it comes out to the general public, uh, just look in the description and you will see links to all of these items on eBay. The next thing I have to show are these wonderful Millefiori beads. These are Italian. I'll hold them up against the white so you get a better look. And then we'll bring them way up close so that you can really see the Millefiori designs. They have a real bright red field behind them, and the detail is good, and that makes me believe that they are by the Moretti Company, which was well known in Italy for making these types of beads for many, many years. We'll hold it this way so you can see better while I talk about it. Millefiori is where they take a whole bunch of different glass rods, melt them together so that they have all these colors in them, and then they chop them off into little pieces, remelt them, and turn them into rounds so that they can make beads out of them. This is a 17-inch strand. Now, when you measure these beads, the 17 inches is the entire length. 
So it goes around like so. It looks great with a hoodie, I know, but you'll get the uh, idea at least. So it drapes much nicer than this if you don't have a hoodie on. But these are really well done, and Moretti beads were considered better than the ordinary, and still are. They're hand knotted. You can see that each bead is made by hand, and then the knotting in between each bead is done by hand. The Moretti beads can sell for rather a lot of money, but I'm starting these at just $19.99, and they're going to sell for whatever they sell for, and we'll find out together. Now the next item I have might surprise you, because this is not a very old piece, and I usually stick to antiques and older vintage, but this has a few interesting characteristics. This is a skateboard, you probably could tell. It is by Kryptonics. They've been around since 1965, so the company actually did a lot of vintage skateboards. They are out of California, and they've got that nice mark on the bottom to tell us, and on this side as well. But what's really special about this particular board, and this board seems to be from about 1990 when the skateboarding really became popular, and you can tell it was used because Somebody's done a little bit of a front side grind on it a few times. It's got a little bit of wear there. It's got a little bit of wear on the back. So somebody did get use out of this, but here's what's really cool. Let's see if I can make this do this. See how the wheels sparkle? There are little lights in them that are pressure activated, so when you're riding your skateboard, you have these really flashy wheels. And that's the reason I bought this skateboard, is because the wheels light up and they work great, and they're still in pretty good condition. Now, somebody may want this board just the way it is, but this company made a lot of boards that are very expensive, and just the sets of wheels oftentimes can sell for $50 to $75 per set if they're in good condition. And these are, and they still work. So that's what's unusual about these. Now, skateboarding, of course, has been a pastime for a long time, ever since people figured out how to strap a board to roller skate wheels and push themselves down the street. But until the 19, late 70s, skateboards were thin. They had little metal roller skate wheels. The bearings weren't great. You weren't really going to go too far on them. In the late 70s and early 80s, that changed. And that's when you get these really thick, heavy, nice wheels. They usually don't light up like these snazzy ones. But that was what got you around. And that was when skateboarding became more of a form of transportation for some people because you could really go long distances, you weren't as likely to trip over a rock, you could do great tricks because you had more underpinning, the boards got wider. And so this is a nice example of something from the beginning of the modern era of skateboarding. And because skateboarding is now so popular and is even considered a sport, and the way that people do it is definitely a sport, it's pretty crazy some of the tricks people can do. I haven't skateboarded in years, so I'm not going to try to demonstrate. But I think this is a really fun thing. I believe that it does have some vintage appeal, and this will either go to somebody who thinks it looks cool or had one and wants to relive that nostalgia, or to somebody who will use this to restore another older one that might be more valuable and need these parts. The next item I have to show you is something that some of you will think is really interesting for its properties, or lack thereof, and some of you may say, oh, I thought it would. Well, let's show you what we're talking about here. This is custard glass, and it is by Imperial Glass Company. After they were purchased by Lennox and became part of that company in 1973. Now, it's custard glass, so of course we always get excited about custard because custard is generally made by using uranium oxides, and that's how you get the color, and that's why it glows under a black light. But hey, wait a second. I have my black light on this, and it doesn't glow at all. And that is what I wanted to show you with this, is that not all custard glass glows. Most custard glass glows, most of it has the uranium in it, but not all of it. So you do have to check. However, 
This is a hard to find color in this particular piece regardless. I looked online and at the time that I found this piece, I looked through all the current and past listings and this came in about 12 different colors and none of them were custard glass. So that was also a surprise to me. This little piece should sell for somewhere in the $20 range. A lot of people don't realize that Imperial Glass was taken over by Lennox. The idea was they'd have a nice glassware company to make glass to go along with their china, but they never really put any money or effort into Imperial, and sadly because of that, Imperial kind of waned and eventually closed. So this is the last generation of Imperial Glass which had a wonderful history, uh, but it's a very nicely molded piece. The quality is still good, and it's a very nice color, as long as you aren't looking for it to be uranium. This is a very pretty opalescent glass pitcher. And if you said, gee, it looks like Fenton, well, you're right, because if you look at the top, the folds are very, very much the mirror image of each other. They're pretty uniform. They, the crimpings are very, very structured. They're not random. It also has a wonderful fire to it. If you could see it from the standpoint that I can see it, you would see opalescent, bright opal, like opal jewelry, fire in the piece. Until the 1960s, they used one type of thing in milk glass that gave it great fire, but after the 1960s, they changed the formula and it doesn't have the opal fire anymore. However, this piece is quite a bit older than that. This piece is from the very, very early years of Fenton. You see the buttons here, and then these feather designs are to be the braids. So buttons and braids. It is a different pattern that a lot of Fenton collectors have never seen because this did not stay in the line very long and was not brought back into the line in the 1950s when Fenton started reproducing its own earlier molded pieces and glass that was more of a Victorian style like this was. So this comes from about 1910. I got it from an estate in Kentucky. It's a very seldom seen pattern, so it's a good one. I believe that this piece should sell for somewhere in the $100 range, and we're going to list it now and see where it goes. Well, you can never go wrong in the antique and vintage business by picking up figures of man's best friend. People love their dogs, women too. And this is a very handsome beagle. This beagle is rather realistic in the same manner of Beswick pottery of England, but this one was made in America. And the thing that distinguishes it, besides the rather realistic nature of it, is in this case, it's got the mark. This says Morton's Studio. And the Mortons emigrated from Europe, started their factory, and their way of constructing these figures, I really shouldn't touch him there, the way they constructed these figures was to do the ceramic over a metal mesh. It gave it a very good quality. It made the ceramics easier to apply. It gave it real substance so that it wouldn't fall over and get broken but it makes it a little bit heavier. So if you pick this up, it's not hollow inside like the average ceramic dog figurine. And that's good for you to know because they made lots of different figures, primarily dogs, although other things as well. And they always feel a little heavier than you're expecting. And oftentimes these little paper labels, as you see, well, they were very easy to take off, peel off, scrape off, and so that label is often not present on a Morton's piece. So if you pick something up and it feels a lot heavier than you would think it was for a figurine of this size, then that's a good clue that this is Morton's studio. Morton's studio did not produce for very long. I believe it was just during the 1940s and early 50s. And so their items are collectible. There's a small but very loyal group of collectors who specifically looks for these because the quality is so good compared to some of the very cute but frankly flimsier Japanese pieces of the same era. And so people really like them. And because of that, the values are a little higher than they would be for a lightweight Japanese piece of the same era. Uh, this should probably sell somewhere in the $25 range, but I'm going to start it at 15 and we'll see what the market thinks of that.
This next piece I'm going to show you on, it is a cuff bracelet. It is copper and it has a great design called Rhythm. This is the Rhythm pattern by the Renoir company. Renoir and Matisse were copper jewelry makers. These are labels you see in the 1950s and early 60s. And I'll show you the earrings that go with. I have the cuff and the earrings together as a set. The earrings, if we are lucky, you'll be able to see the little mark on the back that says, oh yes, I think that's coming in. It says Renoir right there. If they had colored enameling, they would be Matisse. If they don't, then they're Renoir. Rhythm is a really great pattern because it's very Art Deco. But there's another thing that's really good about these and that is the construction quality. If you look at the way it's made, the hinge, even though this is 60 years old, is absolutely tight. They decided to take this same type of manufacturing prowess and use it to make large metal wall plaques under the name Curtis Jure. So when you see Renoir and Matisse jewelry and you think, boy, that's really well made, it's because it's the same people who did Jure wall sculpture that's so popular now. Copper jewelry is something that some people look great in and some people it's not their taste, but the people who like this really like this. It's especially popular in areas where copper is mined. I've seen really high prices in Salt Lake, Utah, Tucson, Arizona, places like that where they really appreciate copper for reasons beyond just the look of it. But it is a really great set and it's really nice to have both that and the earrings together. So the three piece set is going to list now and we are going to start it at a starting bid of $35, but I think it could easily double that by the time it closes. This item is really beautifully done when you look up close. Just like the copper jewelry was so well made, this was very painstakingly made, but it's incredibly fragile, unlike the copper jewelry, because this is a Victorian era, or I should say probably Second Empire French, silhouette cutout in paper. French we know because it's a gentleman under a tree by a memorial reading a book, and the memorial says, A ma mère. The detail is amazing. Look at the trees. This piece is from the 19th century. You notice it's in a frame that is suitable, but it doesn't fit perfectly. And the frame looks like 1930s. Well, there's a good reason for that. In the 1930s, this was one of the first things that became collectible on a widespread basis, along with early American pattern glass, and coins and stamps. These silhouettes from France were one of the first things that people really started to collect. As a result, a whole lot of silhouettes that we're used to, the reverse painted kind that are very cute and oftentimes have advertising on them, started to appear in droves because there was so much interest in these original ones. But this is the real deal. This is 140 or 150 years old. It's in wonderful condition. I would say truthfully that you would want to be careful to make sure it isn't adhered to this backing, but then I would suggest actually putting it against acid-free backing if you are the ultimate owner of this, starting at $79.99. That is a substantial discount to what these go for, so I will be curious to see where it goes when people see it online. I just thought the detail was so great and this one, I got a small collection of them recently. You may have seen in one of my other videos, but this one was the nicest of the bunch. And so I wanted to feature it here. Our next piece is this lovely piece of pottery. And a lot of you will recognize this right away because this is very, very recognizable stuff. This is Roseville pottery. And this is from their floral years. These were the pieces that are probably the most known to collectors in our era. Although Roseville started back in the late 1800s and did a lot of arts and crafts and artware before they did these. 
but in the late 20s they started doing these molded pieces which turned out to be a blessing for them because in the depression when people couldn't afford high-end artware they could afford molded pieces and Roseville's were just a little better done than most of the rest. The sculpting is really, really detailed. This particular one is Gardenia and the painting is really good and you notice that they tried very hard to break up the light and the dark so that it has a realism to it and yet it also has this nice art deco design. There's texture in the mold so it really has a lot of detail as opposed to the Weller pieces or some of the other companies that were producing similar at the time. It's so well marked it's very easy to tell what you have because it says Roseville USA and it has the mark right on the bottom, the mold number and how big it is. So this is eight inches. Now this is actually a lot more than eight inches, but they mean that the bowl is eight inches across. It's actually about 10 and a half from handle to handle. I like the eared handles. I really like the gardenia. It's a pattern that in the heyday of collecting Roseville 30 years ago was a little more overlooked because these gray tones were not really in fashion like they're starting to be now. I think this is a very timely piece because of the color. Now the prices have come down on this to the point where a lot of new collectors are starting to pick up Roseville again, which is great to see. It's a good time to be picking up Roseville again, and I just thought this was a very pretty piece for someone to start with. Now I know this is a bonus video, but if you are enjoying it, please do thumbs up and do click the bell to be notified of future videos if you're a relatively new subscriber because I do regular videos every Monday and Wednesday at 8 p.m. Eastern. Earlier I showed you this Italian Millefiori necklace. From the same era, we have this necklace in a similar color hue, but these look more like Imari from Japan, and indeed these are Imari beads from Japan. They have that red and rust and blue combination that Imari has. They are hand knotted and this is a little longer than the other piece. You also see this clasp. It's absolutely something you see with Asian jewelry. I typically see these on Japanese pieces. This is a nice length. It's a little longer than the other as you can see here. It actually does drape well on a hoodie. This particular one is going to date from about 1980 and that's because the red, white, and blue patriotic colors came back into fashion during the early Reagan years. And so we see more and more people in that era wearing those colors. And let me see if I can get this back in. There we go. It has a nice safety catch. Let me hold it up in front of a white sheet so you can get the color a little more truly. But they're very good quality. Imari is the area in Japan where so much of the ceramic industry exists. Starting with the opening of Japan in 1873 to the west, we see Imari colored porcelains being exported and becoming very popular in the West. And that has continued to this day. And so they continue to make things in those colors because it's pleasing to them and pleasing to us. And so that's why the bead strand is also that. 25 inches total. And again, when we measure necklaces, the easiest way to do it is you take the necklace and you measure from the top to the bottom and multiply by two because it's the entire length if it were open. And some beads are not made to be open. Some don't have a clasp. So that's how you have to measure it. So 25 inches is the total length all the way around. This is a very pretty piece and I think someone will enjoy it. It's starting at only $19 and we're just gonna let the market tell us what the value is today. Well, this next set I'm going to have to show you in phases because it's rather heavy and it goes in this box. This is Wagner cast iron cookware. This is a set of miniatures and this was done for their centennial in 1981. So it's Wagner's 100 year celebration cast iron cookware. And they have nice little pictures on the back of what it is. They also talk about the origins of it because they realized that people were starting to collect 
cast iron. It wasn't just to be used anymore. They found out people were collecting their stuff in the early 80s and they thought, well, we'll make them something to collect. And because of that, they have a nice history on the back where they talk about how Matthias Wagner and his family moved from the part of France that traded back and forth between France and Germany through various wars. But at the time he emigrated in 1891, it was part of France, so he was considered a French immigrant. He came to Sydney, Ohio, and they realized that a lot of the cast iron that they had been used to, the cookware, was being made very cheaply, a lot of times by prisoners, of all things. And so there was no quality control. It was just shove it out the door and who cares? Well, they wanted to make something higher quality. And so they started to make better castings and they quickly became rivals to the Griswold Company and in fact outlasted the Griswold Company down the road in Erie, Pennsylvania. This particular set is really nice because it has not been used you could use these things, but this one has not been. And you can see in there it has the miniature skillet, the little Dutch oven, this square griddle, and then in here is the corn stick pan so that you could make little cornbread sticks. It's just really neat to see the whole thing in the box, unused and original. This was nearing the end of Wagner's cast iron production. Other than the Lodge Company in Tennessee, most cast iron cookware now is made in Asia, uh, particularly in Taiwan. And while it's suitable and useful, the quality is not as good as the American made pieces were. So a lot of people, now that the keto diet is becoming popular, are returning to cast iron cooking and they're buying older pieces not just to collect but to use and that's an exciting development and that's part of the reason cast iron has become rather expensive in the marketplace for collectors. It's a fairly heavy box when it's all said and done it's about six pounds. We're starting this off at $35. I believe that the selling prices these days are closer to 50 to 75 and we'll find out. Well, I'm modeling the next item that I have up for sale, and I'll have to pull the camera way back so that you can see it fully, but it is this Cordovan leather jacket, and it is very 1970s, and I can't wait to show you the style, so let me get the camera where you can see it. You get to look at my shipping center behind me, but this is it. I think it's rather stylish from the 70s. It was a nice uh, way to be able to keep things in one pocket and keep your hands in these side pockets for warmth. There we go. So I think it's kind of styling. And I have had viewers ask to buy shirts that I was wearing. So I thought, well, I'll wear this coat and this is something I'm actually willing to sell. It's a pretty good fit for me. It's a 38. I really wear a 40 long, but it fits me pretty well in the shoulders, which is good. I'm a little broad shoulder for as thin as I am. So that means that it should fit the average guy pretty well. It's got a nice liner. It doesn't have any rips. It's got its original interior buttons for closure if you wanted those as well. And it is by Cooper, and you can see the label here. Cooper is known primarily for bomber jackets these days, but back in the day they were making things that looked like this because this was the style. I can show you the back. It's got a nice seam up the back. So I thought it was very handsome. The condition is really good. It doesn't have a lot of um, really any real major wear or staining around the collar, which is very important. The only thing I could find on it is one very, very tiny and possibly removable little mark here. And I am not inclined to try to get that off myself because I don't have a good leather cleaner that I trust right now. And I would rather sell it the way it is to somebody who maybe is a little bit more proficient with those sorts of things. Now, even though Cooper Sportswear was made in New York, I found this particular jacket sitting unused for many, many years in a closet in Kentucky. And it is just dying to get out on the streets and be worn again. So maybe someone out there will fall in love with it and you will look 
very cool and very retro. It's starting at just $25. I do believe that it will value somewhere between $50 and $100. We'll find out what kind of modern day fashion plate is ready to show this off. And while we're on the subject of the 70s, my next item is this Coca-Cola radio in the original box. Now these are not tremendously rare, but finding them in working order is a lot harder than it used to be. These were made in Hong Kong around 1980. There were a whole bunch of novelty radios. They did 7-Up cans. I had one of those when I was a kid. It actually lasted for a long time, but they were not made to last for a long time, so finding these in working order is not as easy as it used to be. This is right about the time that Coca-Cola started using its logo in merchandising in a really big way. Beyond just trays and obvious things related to beverages, they started making all sorts of items that had the Coke logo on it, and this is a good example. This one does work. It's got the original box. It's also got the original styrofoam. And when you open the original styrofoam, it's got the original everything. It's still got the cellophane wrapper. And in here, you can send in, since the original owner never did, the warranty label. The warranty, which is guaranteed through Bottle Radio of Atlanta, Georgia, expires 90 days after the item was first received, which was probably 1980, so we're probably out of warranty at this point. However, I don't think you'll have to worry about it because it has not really been used and it's just really cool. I thought it was a fun thing. It's something that's a nostalgia kick. It's one of these things that's becoming more collectible and more valuable because the current generation of collectors is really interested in finding things from their childhoods. And a lot of the people who are collecting now were kids in the 70s and 80s. I'm going to be starting this in the eBay listing at $15. It should sell for double that. Next, we're going back in time from 1980 to 1880 or thereabouts. This is a beautiful little casserole dish. And it's a rather unusual form when we see who made it, which we will in a moment. I'm going to take the lid off first so that I can show you the mark. Because it is the original RS Prussia mark with the green wreath and the red printing. RS stands for Roland Schlegelmilch. And Roland Schlegelmilch and his sons operated various factories making porcelain in the areas of Germany that were just coming out of feudalism and becoming nation states, one of which was Prussia. They also had a factory in, Louis in Silesia. They had a factory in Tillowitz. Eventually, when Germany comes together, the wares are all marked RS Germany when Germany becomes a nation and stops being a loosely associated group of feudal territories. So this is an early piece of RS Prussia. It's got a great Rococo style finial, not just a straight knob. And that's a wonderful offset to what otherwise is a very balanced design. The flowers, the open roses, are transfer wear, and there is hand painting as well. well. RS Prussia was so well made, it was expensive when it was new in the 1980s. Reproduction started to appear. It's easy to research the marks on the reproductions. The, they are not correct. The colors in the wreath are wrong. The spacing of the letters is wrong. The wreath itself may be wrong. There's a whole lot of them that have the wreath, but not RS. They have an I and an X, like Roman numerals. Those were made in Asia in the 1980s and 90s. And they're nice, but they are not the same quality when you hold them side by side. So RS Prussia, again, like Roseville, is one of those things that was very collectible. The prices have come way down because people were scared off by reproductions and now people understand the reproductions and are dipping their toes back into collecting because look at the beauty of this thing. Uh, it's just exquisite. I mean all of the detail. When you make something like this you have to have someone make a sculpture of this piece 
because that's how they cast the master molds and then the master molds are where you pour the porcelain after you make secondary molds for production and it is quite sculptural. Look at the delicacy of the handles. I just cannot get over how beautiful RS Prussia really is and the quality is wonderful. So a great area to be collecting, especially because this piece and the casserole dishes are much more unusual and hard to find. The berry bowl sets are what you see a lot more often and simple plates and things. This is an unusual form. I'm only starting it at $39.99. I believe it's worth around $100 today. At the peak of RS Prussia collecting, this might have been worth $250 to $300. Now from a beautiful casserole dish, we are switching gears and going to show you a plain and utilitarian soup spoon. And you think, well, what is the big deal about that? Why don't you show us something beautiful again? Well, there is a real beauty to this for railroad collectors because this particular piece on the handle you will see says Erie in that diamond. And that means this is from the Erie and Lackawanna Railroad. And that makes it railroad utensil. Now, a lot of people know that railroad china is collectible. A lot fewer people understand that lots of things from the railroad are collectible and that the utensils and silverware from railroads, from steamship lines, and even from airlines is now rather collectible. This very basic little soup spoon was made by International Silver. It has their mark on the back. That does not mean that it is silver. It is silver plate over a base metal. This would have been made sometime in the 1920s in all likelihood and used in the dining cars on the train. I don't really like polishing, you can tell. But I will probably polish it so that it's nice and shiny for its new owner. But this very simple little spoon is something that we see sell in the 30 to 35 dollar range per spoon. So this is why I wanted to show this to you. Not only do I love railroad stuff, I was a rail fan from way back. I had a model train set when I was a kid. I used to go over to Seattle and sneak around in the train yards and look for ephemera that I could take home. Uh, you know, old things that they'd thrown away, the old paper logs and train orders and that sort of thing. I just thought it was fascinating. And a lot of people like me grew up to become collectors of this sort of thing. So there is an active audience for this. And if you're a reseller and you're in a thrift store and there is a pile of old silver plate, this is something that you might want to check through because you will find transportation silver the next item I have to list is something that might be considered politically incorrect on the surface, but it was not intended that way. It is the magazine of midgets. Nowadays, we refer to folks who are unusually short as little people, but there actually is a difference between being a midget and dwarfism. It has to do with proportions of the body and in some cases the causes of that situation. And back in the 1930s, 40s, and 50s, when this book was published, midgets were considered very interesting, thanks in large part to the Wizard of Oz, which thankfully made people normalize them, thanks to the munchkins. A lot of them became stars and celebrities, and so people started to see them as actual people instead of circus sideshow freaks, which was a big improvement. And one of the people who definitely understood that was Bob Hermine, who created a traveling show that featured little people. And you'll see on the front cover of this, he refers to Gulliver's Travels, and here's all these little folks in Gulliver's Travels, the book. And then on the back, Here's this suitcase with all these folks coming out and they're in a band and they're in a drill team and they're coming out of this suitcase. Well, the suitcase has all these different logos from the 1939 New York and San Francisco World's Fairs because a lot of these folks who were in this particular show had appeared in those World's Fairs and became even more famous. 
And what's nice is when you look at the articles inside, they're really very humanizing. They talk about love and marriage and romance between these people. They, they show them as real people having real lives. And they dispel some common misperceptions of the time, like, can they have children? The neat thing about this to me is that they show members of the troupe. A lot of these folks were in The Wizard of Oz and were famous for appearing in other mass media of the time. So it's really a very loving look at the people who were a part of this performing troupe. And they show them doing their vaudeville acts. I think the great thing about this is the graphics. I think the great thing about it is that they show the contrasts as they progress through time. And I think the great thing about this is that it made them celebrities, but it made them celebrities based on what they could do. And the fact that they were small people doing it made it more interesting, but it wasn't the only thing about them that was considered interesting. So I think it's actually a very sweet book and very interesting. They show them in Lilliput town. This particular book is starting at $14.99. I will put the listing up right now. And then it has a buy it now on it. So if somebody really wants this, they have that chance as well. I just think it's a really interesting piece and I see them on occasion. This is the only one I've ever had. I don't think a lot of people kept these, so they're not terribly, terribly available. So someone will have fun with this. So as I like to say, we're at the penultimate item of the evening and it is, it's just beautiful. I, I've really been holding this aside. I was so tempted to take it to a show because I knew it would sell right away, but I didn't want to do that. I wanted to share it with you all. And so I'm glad I held on to it and here it comes. It's a bride's bowl, but it's more than just your ordinary bride's bowl. It's quite large, it's quite deep. It is a pink satin on milk glass and it has a great opal fire to the edges. It's got really nice enameling, but that's not all that's special about these because you do see these fairly frequently. They were very popular as bridal gifts in the Victorian era, but what they rarely have, if they have anything, they usually have a basket bale, a little stand with a nice silver plated basket and you lift it up and that's your bride's basket. But this one, has a gorgeous figural silver plate stand. And look at her. I'm gonna take the bowl off so I can show you the base a little bit more carefully. She has such poise. It's such a wonderful sculpture with the dress and all of the detail, the bare feet, even the feet are good and that's a sign of good sculpture feet are hard to do. She's just wonderful and lovely and in really great condition. She's got the William Rogers mark on the base. She was made by Rogers Silver Plate to go with the basket. The basket would have been made by one of the New England companies. I do not believe it was Mount Washington. Mount Washington was primarily known at this time, which would be around the 1890s or right around 1900 for peach blow, which was a pink colored glass, but it went to more of a peach than the milk glass that you see here. So here's the bowl. The bowl itself is quite well done. Notice how the crimps are not all exactly the same and even. So it's not a Fenton piece. This actually predates Fenton by at least 10 years. It's got nice painted enameling and then some gilding. The gilding has some wear. There used to be more of a defined bow knot here. But when you wash these many, many times over many, many years, particularly if you do a big no-no, which is to use ammonia-based cleansers like Windex or glass cleaner on them, well, it will wear some of that gold away. And over time, some of the gold has worn on this. But all of the enameling, because that paint is fired, is in great shape, no chips, 
very sweet little wreaths. This is a lot of detail and a very deep mold. And a lot of handwork went into this. This was hand blown. You can see the pontal mark on the bottom. And it doesn't show a lot of wear on the bottom because again, it's been in this holder for many, many years. This came from a Chicago area estate. I just think it's quite grand. And if you had it on a table and were looking down into the bowl and then see here underneath, you really get the idea of why these were so special. And they were made to be given as bridal gifts. This was the fancy thing you had in the parlor on the table to impress your guests. And it was something that would have been given to you because these were pretty expensive back then. And they're not cheap now, although the prices, again, for a lot of Victorian like this are not as expensive as they used to be. And it is a great time to be collecting these, and we're seeing renewed interest amongst Victoriana. I got to spend uh, last weekend with a couple of different uh, YouTubers, Fatbird Finds, Real Nifty Vintage, and Thrifter Junker Vintage Hunter, and Winking Owl Antiques. We all got together and went shopping at a show in Princeton, Indiana, and both we and the dealers there all commented on how we are seeing people becoming interested in Victorian fancy designs. It seems to be the next reaction. We've had mid-century and very clean lines for a long time, and now some people, especially oddly enough, we're noticing millennials, are wanting something that's very fancy and fussy because they've never had that in their lives before. They're not old enough to remember when fancy and frilly was the thing. So this is new to them and they think it's interesting. And I do too. It's just a beautiful piece and I'm excited to put it out. It is starting at $95. I believe that the value is somewhere in the 250 range. We'll see if the market agrees with me. And that brings us to our last item of the evening. This set has no mark. It's a very pretty set, but it is not what I thought it was initially. I thought it was by the Shriner Company, and Shriner is a great name in costume jewelry, so that would be a very good thing because this set might be worth 250 or 300 if it were Shriner. Shriner did have earring backs with holes in them, and when you have an unmarked piece you have to look at the construction to try to identify. However, it turns out these holes are a little smaller than Shriner's. Shriner also did domed construction, but so did the Warner and Regency Company. I put this out there thinking it was Shriner, and the grandson of Mr. Shriner showed me this. The hook and eyes, which was a hallmark of their construction, have flat wires going into them, and the Shriner Company never used flat wires. They used real hooks because they didn't want to damage the backing when they put the piece together. And they also did these unsigned pieces for a company called Norell. Now, Mr. Norell liked diamonds, and so he wanted clear stones in his costume jewelry. And if you see the piece here, it has Aurora Borealis stones. So this is either Warner or Regency. Still a nice set worth about $85, and you can buy it from me directly at the antique nomad at gmail.com, but I ended up not listing it on eBay because I did not want to misinform people. Thank you so much for joining me. I am George the Antique Nomad. I'm really glad to have you with me. Thank you so much to my level two members for making this bonus video possible. Thank you so much to all of my members and subscribers and everyone who watches, whether you're subscribed or not, but if you would subscribe, uh, please do, because then you can click that button and be notified of future videos. I have a list underneath me here of various social media where I post regularly, and I look forward to seeing you again somewhere out here, either in real-world antiquing or in the online world. Bye-bye for now, and thank you again. Thanks for joining me again in the fun and fascinating antique community here where online meets the real world. Please click the subscribe button below, click the bell to be notified when new videos upload, leave a comment below, and hit thumbs up to like this video. Links to our online social media daily posts and our items for sale are in the description. This is George at The Antique Nomad. Bye for now!